1994, in the vast Sahara Desert, a man got lost alone after becoming disoriented by a sandstorm during a marathon race. A search and rescue operation was done to find him, but for nine days, not a shadow of him was ever found. Everyone thought he will never be seen again. Without food and drinking water, he had little or no chance to survive in this unforgiving desert. This is the true story of Mauro Prosperi, the man who went through nine days of hell in the Sahara Desert and lived to tell the tale. Sahara Desert, both beautiful and dangerous, paradise and nightmare. It is the largest desert in the world, with an area of 9.2 million square kilometers or 3.5 million square miles, larger than the land area of the entire America. The average temperature here is 38 degrees Celsius, which sometimes reaches beyond 40 degrees to 47 degrees in the summer. During extreme heat, the sand particles here can hurt the skin, nose, and throat. No one wants to be stranded alone in this kind of place. But unfortunately, for Mauro Prosperi, this was a nightmare he had to face. Mauro is a pentathlete, an athlete who participates in five different sporting events, born on July 13, 1955 in Rome, Italy. After completing his education in 1974, he started working for the National Police Force as a crowd control officer. When he learned about the Marathon de Sab, a 251-kilometer ultramarathon held in Morocco over six days, he immediately prepared to participate. He started training. He runs 40 kilometers every day and has reduced his water intake so that his body can get used to the feeling of dehydration that usually occurs when a person is in a hot place. And in April 1994, along with 80 other participants, the 38-year-old Mauro joined his first desert event. The marathon had six stages or stations, so it takes six days, one station per day, to finish the race. Each participant carried their own supply of food, clothing, sleeping bag, compass, portable stove, emergency kit, and a signal flare in their backpack. And they were given water supply at each station checkpoint. The run started in Foum Zguid, Morocco on April 10, 1994. All the participants started the morning run at the same time, but because the runners had their own pace, each participant appeared to be running alone. Some are way ahead, while some were behind the others. During the first three days, Mauro had already run 96 kilometers of terrain. It consisted of salt beds, rocky soils, and sand dunes. On the fourth day, April 14th, where each participant had the longest run of 85 kilometers, this was where Mauro Prosperi's suffering began. After noon, he had run far, and he was in fourth place. The temperature reached 46 degrees that day, and due to the intensity of the sun's rays on the sand, a sandstorm gradually formed until it became very intense and powerful. With the force of the wind, Mauro couldn't see anything. But because he didn't want to break his momentum, he thought that if he stopped, he might be covered by the sandstorm. So he continued running. He crossed the small sand dunes to take a shortcut. In his mind, then, this too will pass and I will see the road again. What Mauro didn't realize was that the roads were covered with sand. The sandstorm lasted eight hours. It was almost dark when it subsided. Mauro still continued to run. It was only after a while that Mauro realized that he couldn't see any road, and then he felt that his nose and throat were bleeding. This is because he inhaled sand particles during the height of the sandstorm. Mauro thought to rest and continue again the next day. He laid down under a bunch of plants, covered his face with a towel, and slept. The next day, as soon as he woke up, he immediately started running. He ran straight ahead for several hours, believing that he would meet or see a fellow runner on the road at any moment. He thought of climbing the highest dune to see what was around him. After he reached the top of the sand dune, he became depressed. He couldn't see any sign of the race trail. He couldn't see anything familiar everywhere he turned. Only then did he realize that he was lost. And if that bad news wasn't enough, he saw that his water bottle was almost empty. He needed to minimize drinking water. He knew he wouldn't last long in that desert if he didn't have water. That's when he thought he was going to pee in another bottle. He would recycle his urine so he won't get dehydrated. He didn't want to, but he had to drink his urine if he wanted to live. And in compliance with the race regulation, Mauro did not leave that exact spot while waiting for help to arrive. Shortly after sunset, he noticed a helicopter heading in his direction. He was relieved, 
He expected it was a helicopter from the marathon organizers and was looking for him. He immediately took out his signal flare and fired it, but the pilot did not notice it. The smile disappeared from his face. The next day, Morrow decided to walk, to find water and shelter because he thought that if he stayed in that place, he might get a heat stroke. He took the compass out of his backpack but saw nothing in every direction but a vast ocean of sand. After a few hours of walking, he found a maraboot. A maraboot is a Muslim temple. He ran towards it, hoping to find someone inside, but there was no one. It was just an abandoned building. Mauro used the old temple as his shelter for several days while waiting and hoping that those who were looking for him would find him. While there, he gradually ate his bag of food by cooking it in his urine, using a portable burner he had with him. He tried to quench his thirst by sucking on the wet wipes he brought with him, licking the dew off the rocks every morning and constantly drinking his own urine. One day, he thought of climbing to the top of the temple and tied a small Italian flag there. He hoped it would attract the attention of those who were looking for him and those who passed by, and also to serve as evidence to his family that he was there, in case he dies. And while there at the top, Morrow noticed bats in the Maraboot's tower. He caught some and decapitated them with his pocket knife, sucked the blood and ate the raw flesh just to give his body some strength. He also hunted for beetles, lizards, and even bird eggs, and absorbed any juice he could get from cooking their flesh. On the fourth day of his disappearance, he saw another plane flying in his direction. He hurried out and wrote in the sand SOS to draw attention to the pilot. He also quickly took his backpack and set it on fire, hoping that the smoke coming out of it would attract more attention. But as the smoke rose, suddenly another sandstorm came. In an instant, the SOS he had written was erased, and the fire in the bag he was burning went out. Twelve hours passed before the sandstorm subsided. Morrow felt as if heaven and earth had fallen. He was still stranded in that desert. His hope that he will be saved had collapsed. At night, Using a piece of charcoal, he made a farewell letter or suicide note for his family, and using a pocket knife, he slashed his wrist. In Mauro's mind at that moment, I don't want to die like this. I don't want to die slowly and gradually. I'd rather end my life quickly, and if I die here, there is great hope that my body will be found. If that's the case, my wife won't have too much trouble getting my pension. There is a law in Italy that states that it takes ten years before a missing person is declared dead. Mauro doesn't want his wife to suffer another decade before she can use his police pension. Mauro waited all night for death to pick him up, but it never came. He woke up the next morning with only a little bleeding on his wrist. Because his slash was not that deep, and because of his dehydration, the blood clotted in his veins so it did not continue to flow out. So he was still alive. Mauro suddenly had a new vigor to live, a new determination to fight. He was encouraged, and got up again and walked out of the temple. For several days, Mauro walked and walked. He timed his walks when the sunlight was less intense, at dawn and at night. When the sun went up, he hid in the shade of tall sand dunes, cliffs, and caves or trees. And at night, he dug on the sand and buried his body there to fight the extreme cold. Until one day, he saw a mountain in the distance. His eyes widened. This was what he had been waiting for a long time, a real hope. He walked a little faster, even though his whole body almost had no strength. He had to move on. He will live. He can be saved. This was what he had in mind. He continued walking in the direction of the mountain. And as the days passed, the mountain grew bigger and bigger in his sight, almost within reach. On the eighth day of his absence, he found an oasis. Morrow dragged his feet towards it, but due to the severity of the swelling in his throat and mouth due to dehydration, he was unable to swallow water. He threw it up with every attempt to drink. He became even weaker. He lay down next to the small lake and just fit in to sip the water that was scooped up with his hands. And then he fell asleep. Upon waking up, he filled his bottle with water and walked towards the mountain again. A few hours later, he saw a sign of life, goat poop, and still fresh. He followed them. After a while, he saw human footprints, and he saw a girl tending goats. He was so happy, he ran screaming for help to the girl. But the girl got scared of him, screamed, and ran away. Desperately, Mauro shouted, Wait a minute! Don't leave! Have mercy! Help me! But the child disappeared from his sight. He wondered why the young girl was afraid of him. 
He took his signal mirror and put it in front of his face. He was very surprised by what he saw. He didn't know the man in the mirror. It was skin and bones, sunken eyes like a corpse. But Mauro did not lose hope. He followed the young girl's footsteps, and after a while, he saw a group of Tuareg nomads in a small oasis. The Tuareg women took care of him inside the camp, gave him something to drink and eat. But Mauro just threw up everything. The men put him on a camel and took him to the nearest village. There, he was picked up by the military police and was taken to the military base. But Mauro Prosperi's struggles were not over yet. When he arrived at the military base, he was blindfolded and interrogated by the authorities thinking he was a Moroccan spy. Only after his identity was confirmed was he taken to the hospital. There, Mauro found out that he was no longer in Morocco but in Algeria, 289 kilometers away from where the marathon was held. Little did he know that he had already crossed the Jebel Tani mountain and the Moroccan border during his nine-day journey while lost. Mauro lost 15 kilograms or 33 pounds. He spent seven days in the hospital of Tindouf, Algeria, and used 16 liters of IV before he was rehydrated. His liver was damaged, so for several months he only ate soup, liquids, and blended foods. His kidney suffered permanent damage due to the amount of urine he drank. He experienced severe leg cramps for a whole year, and it took two years before his physical and mental health completely recovered. This experience of Mauro Prosperi is a testimony of a very strong willpower, a test of stability of mind and body and spirit. He survived because maybe that was his destiny. He survived because he wanted to.